afternoon. This is Think Tech Hawaii. I'm Chuck Crumpton. It's time for responsible change. And we're going to talk about some of the assaults on democracy and where they're coming from and where they might be going and how we might hopefully have some of those up at the pass. We're extremely fortunate to have with us today retired state judge Sandra Sims, also a noted author and community leader, <clears throat> Wei Zing, a very highly respected civil litigation attorney, partner in a large law firm and women's rights advocate for many years, Bill Harrison, a leading criminal defense and civil rights attorney here, and Tina Patterson, a mediator, arbitrator, urban planner, and master of many trades from New Jersey. Louise, yesterday you folks put on a program that the recording of will be available soon. Can you tell us a little bit about that so the viewers can be on the lookout for it and get a sure, chance Chuck. to see it? Sure, Chuck. And thank you so much for those of us, those of you who did have the time to tune Thanks. in. Um, it was our, our firm Denton's Smart Cities Connected Communities um, Think Tank Forum. And I was lucky enough to be invited to be a part of this one, which was focused on the pillar of social equity in communities. And um, our firm's um, energy uh, practice group head, Clint Vince, has been organizing these Smart Cities Think Tank sessions on just all my manner of issues that affect this, our cities and the future of our communities. And what I loved about this one was that he drew together a very diverse panel, um, a leader from the Hispanic community, um, the black community, a colleague of ours, um, who's a law partner, um, and, uh, an, an Asian American um, individual, Bob G, who's been very active in um, at the uh, national Asian American uh, politics scene. And then um, another partner um, from the, who's a, has been active in LGBT and marriage rights. And so we just talked about the issues facing our particular, you know, the, our respective communities. I think what came out of it and was a, a really nice, um, well, uh, email from one of the panelists was that even though we came from different perspectives, um, so many, of us, I mean, we all shared common thoughts about the issues facing the country in terms of, uh, you know, the politics of division versus the need to recognize diversity and the kinds of things that we as um, citizens and community members should be and could be doing. So, Luis, let me ask, why are those conversations about a still very controversial set of topics among such a diverse range of participants, panelists. Why are those important now? What might they help accomplish? Well, I think um, perhaps fueled by the pandemic and by you know, the last four years of very divisive rhetoric and politics, it just seems like um, the divides in our country have come to a head in so many ways, whether it's racial, economic, and we see that manifested in just the, almost the daily assault of news stories. Um, you know, anti-Asian violence was one of the triggers for how I got on the panel. But uh, you know, before that, it was well. In the midst of that, there was whole Black Lives Matter. Before that, there was just the whole history of assaults on various racial groups. And um, not to mention just violence in general. We talked last time about the violence in, in Boulder. Um, and there's just, a you know, so many of us want to be able to say that we can go back and enjoy our communities and cities without being afraid of infection, violence, or just, you know, being targets of racial violence. So I, I'm really glad to see that there's conversations going on at so many levels. Um, nationally in our community, um, among corporations. So it's an important time. We need to sort of heal the uh, divisive, divisiveness that has really um, plagued us for the past few years. So Tina, Sandra, Bill, what are some of the important conversations uh, among diverse 
leadership people that you're seeing happening and need to happen now? Well, what I'm seeing happening um, is that people are speaking out um, as to uh, what's going on in the political scene with regard to uh, voters' rights, that that's a big area that um, you know people are starting that conversation on, and recognizing what that really means uh, to our, our society. Um, it, it's the basis of representation and community voices, and uh, it, it's really appalling that uh, we are having to deal with this issue uh, at this point in time, uh, after this most recent election, uh, that people are dissatisfied with the outcome of the election and trying to tinker with the system. Um, that's been in place, you know, for since the beginning of our country, and and they're and they're trying to uh, use it uh, to uh, further divide the country and to uh, uh, to get a one-upsmanship on uh, certain segments of the community, and, and that's really disheartening. And so the conversation has started, and I think that we need to to continue that conversation. Can Here I, and. Yeah, here in, in, in Hawaii, I think that's very true, true, Bill. But here in Hawaii, I know I'm still working with the uh, Judiciary and the State Bar Association and the Judiciary History Center on the racial um, equity series that we began in January. And we finished up on the last on the last of the discussions and we're in the process of preparing for the roundtable. And what we've learned there and what we've seen there is by the sheer numbers of people participating, that there is a real desire for people in our communities to begin to address these issues. We're also seeing a great diversity of the agencies and entities that are involved in injustice being a part of this, from the prosecutors, from, you know, from the uh, prison reform, uh, from the uh, eight, from the organizations within the communities, the NAACP, the J, uh, JACL, Japanese American Citizens, Citizens League, for those that are listening and not aware of that, and Popola Project and many, many others. We are Oceana, which is a, a, um, an agency that's involved in addressing issues within our uh, Micronesian community, which are very serious uh, as well. We're all looking at health issues. We're looking at, um, people involved in public safety, police departments, and all of them are being a part of this discussion because we have to have this discussion. We have to address these issues. Our communities, our state, our nation is at risk. It's that this is, we just have to do it. And I'm, I'm pleased though that there are so many people, uh, again, demonstrated by uh, Denton's involvement and some of the involvement you know, that Bill and others have seen that there are people interested and ready to take a stance and that's that's very encouraging to me and i think we're gonna we're gonna get through this and we we've had some wounds opened and exposed and things in our community that we need to address mental health is, is among them gun violence is among them as well as the issues regarding you know racism and and violence uh against against asians and and what you know blacks have been experiencing all this time but all these things are being exposed and seen and known. You can't unknow it. You know, someone who's just sort of wanted to just think that these things just don't happen around me. You have to see it and you have to know it. And it's really kind of calling upon more people to have to say, I've, I've got to take a stand. I can't just be silent and just, you know, let it just slide past. You can't be silent. You have so, to be there. That's perfect. And Tina, if I may ask you, what are some of the conversations and the people and entities speaking up now that we had not seen before, or might not have been expected to? Sure. So I'm, I'm in Maryland and the mm -hmm. District of Columbia, Maryland and Virginia, um, we're seeing more interaction intergenerational, but also among the faith community, business mm -hmm. community, as well as for-profit groups and people and organizations coming together and saying, how, how can we work collaboratively? Um, there, and I think Sandra brought up a good point. Right now, the, the, the theme is stop Asian violence, but this is not new. And depending on where you live and the demographics of your community, Asian violence has been happening. And, and I think Andrew Yang described it perfectly. This is not new. The, the only difference now 
it's it's in the news and it's it's been probably recorded or someone videotaped it and it hit social media so the the players now are again intergenerational you have inner you have faith communities coming in and saying we need to support our people we have groups who have been have been partners saying it is not just a nice to do it's unnecessary it's a must this is not um we want you to go out and and support a particular candidate this is your life is at risk and we need you to support in solidarity and so it's that message of solidarity versus a siloed effect black lives matter asian lives matter everyone's life matters every person of color life matters and when we look at and i think about the book how democracies die what we're seeing is almost a, a page out of that book so yeah. when you have literally impacted one group you move to the next group then when that group has been impacted you move to the next group so right now we have multiple conversations going on and when we bring to a focal point saying this is happening in my community this is happening in your community do we see the common thread and that's the conversation that i'm hearing it's it's unsettling at the same time because people are seeing commonalities but it's also helpful and a step forward because I think about the the old adage a house divided never stands so if we are unified and we're all looking at if i'm out and louise is having is being hassled i need to speak up and i would hope that that the same person would do the same for me or someone would do the same for me and, and also our younger people how how can you be and i i know this word is used a lot how can you be not just an ally but an advocate that's what i'm seeing and i'm i'm glad for it it is i think the other part is understanding that this is not a race this is not going to change overnight um and we have to be both steadfast but we also have to be firm and it may mean and we been the other conversation i've been hearing is on the economic side um are you supporting a business that's not supporting you the group that you you identify with why are you using your precious hard earned income to give to that organization and i am not going to mention any organizations in this recording but you know i make a conscious decision when i go grocery shopping there's some companies i no longer purchase their goods it's made me a little bit more um innovative in terms of how i cook but um it, it's to me it's a, it's a statement and for businesses it's about your bottom line so my 10 15 combined with five other people combined with five more people it starts to add up and it makes a business rethink well, that's a it really <laughs> it's a really valuable insight because one of the things that people in agriculture and retail and travel industry and others have reflected is that the pandemic didn't so much change as accelerate and augment the direct connection between providers and consumers hey, there just wasn't room for the delay or expense of the middle entity or person hey, and we're seeing a recognition not only among the providers of goods and services but the consumers that their voices count and the technology of social media is making available viral responses to things who could have imagined not 10 years ago 5 years ago 1 year ago a year ago one exactly. month ago who could have imagined uh-huh. that major league baseball would pull the all-star game out of a state because of the voter suppression law and there are disputes about how extensive that voter suppression is but it's serious enough and it generated enough adverse reaction among the public the consumer base that probably the largest athletic entertainment industry in the world has pulled its signature event and placed it in Colorado. Chuck, we saw something similar several years ago with the NBA in Charlotte. So, um yes. I, I I do think that there is um 
there's something to be said when we're talking about these franchises. Again, it's back to the dollars and cents. Um, if you know that people are not going to visit your your destination, it not only hurts that specific um, facility, but it's the hotels, it's the restaurants, okay. it's the people who may made the, the the trip a more extended stay, and those revenue that are coming to to your destination. Um, does it always have to be this large scale? Absolutely not. But it, it does. I think it's something that we need to talk about more. And we saw this in the 60s where economic boycotts and, you know, staying away was one of the ways that you usually got an institution's attention, whether it was I'm not going to invest in your company, I'm not buying your stock or I'm selling your stock or I'm not coming to your store or I'm not gonna use your particular service. And it, it, again, back to the bottom line. Um, but oftentimes the people that we, back to the topic of violence, are these necessarily the individuals that are acting out, that are engaged in these acts of violence? Not always, it's not the person who has the, who owns the facility where the basketball game takes place or the baseball game is taking place. It's the person that you sit next to in the office or the person who lives around the corner from you. What do we do there? Yes, yes. And that's the troubling part of it is that while we are seeing these you know, stances taken by you know, the major entities and, 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 and the people who are part of those as well, what we are not getting and not seeing clearly is that person sitting next to you, that person that's gonna be the one that you know, pulls out the gun or pulls out the knife or as we just saw today, you know, charges into a nail salon and starts harassing people. How do we, what do we do about that? Um, I mean, certainly we take a stance in support of, you know, the people who are working there. As Tina said, you know, you're going to stand up and say something, but there's still these little pockets where these incidents occur. And, uh, you, you know, you, you, you have to, begin to wonder what brings a person to a place to make that kind of a stance. I mean, that, that's one of the questions I, I, I keep asking. It's like, okay, you know, we understand, you know, Major League Baseball taking a stand. We understand, you know, companies saying I'm taking this posture, taking this position. But how do we talk to that person that's running around with the, you know, with the, with the ability to do harm right in our midst. I don't, I don't, I don't know that I have a, I don't have an answer. I don't have an answer for that. I, because I'm still not totally comprehending that. But maybe it's not a question. Maybe it's a condition. Maybe it's a habit, a pattern. When the president of the country incites hundreds of people yeah. to organize weeks and months in advance and plan and travel hundreds of miles to gather to physically violently invade and threaten and intend to harm law enforcement, elected officials. And after that happens, hey, prominent elected leaders out of one side of their mouth say, those were impeachable offenses out of the other side, but I'm not gonna vote to convict him because he still manages and controls the donors and the money. And I need that for my political gain and purposes. Maybe we're at a point where the erosion of all respect or almost all respect for those political leaders has reached a point where people are lashing out. How do we counter that? Well, you know, I think that we all have a personal responsibility um, to, to one another. And, and that, that, that became evident when, um, you know, this, this poor lady was um, kicked and beaten in the street when people closed their doors and walked away. And that's not the first time. I mean, I remember as, as a young man 
Um, the same thing happening in New York City where, where a woman was actually um, physically beaten and raped and people was yeah. watching the whole episode and, and no one took personal responsibility. And, and that goes to like the, the fabric of our community. We as a community must take responsibility for one another. And I think it starts from there. And if we start doing that, I think from that point on, we can build uh, on that and uh, make sure that things like this don't happen. And a lot of these these situations, we have people come forward and say, well, I knew this guy and he said this and he did that and everything else. And they didn't come forward. No one came forward. Uh, and if someone had done that and taken personal responsibility for uh, that knowledge and sharing that knowledge with the appropriate authorities, maybe that incident where people were, were killed, eight people were killed, wouldn't have happened. Um, maybe there would have been some intervention that took place. And I think that's where we need to begin is with that personal responsibility. And we're seeing that in the Chauvin trial. It's, you know, and I'm, the good part is it's bringing to the national fore the fact that here are these people that, you know, had the presence of mind to film what was going on, but now they are coming, having to deal with their own sense of guilt of just not having taken more steps to intervene. Um, and, it, it, you know, the other point, and I think we had raised this in t a couple of weeks ago with gun violence is exactly what you say, Bill, it is that sense of personal responsibility and how can a, you know, a bystander safely intervene um, or a family member? I mean, it just seems like there's so many times we hear about an act of violence and um, it's by these troubled, often youngish men who have had um, psychiatric or other incidents in their lives maybe there were red flags but you know people either ignored them or or didn't recognize them for what they were it's frustrating well and it but, leads but to I, a question right which is uh -huh. you look at the way that the defense is conducting the chauvin trial and they are clearly making statements that are manifestly untrue they are perpetuating that sense that pattern of the big lie that for four years people thought worked for them and that a number of our leaders, whether it's Georgia's Governor Kemp or Mitch McConnell or somebody else, they're still doing that. And they're still feeling like they have complete impunity in getting away with it. Is there a connection between the assault on truth and the addiction to violence that results in assaults on completely unknown, undeserving people? I think so. I, I do. I think so. And I think that the, the nexus is the sense of power and the sense of losing power. Um, mm -hmm. I, I, there's a video I'm currently in, enrolled in a anti-racism workshop. Um, actually, it's not a workshop. It's a training program. And the very first video is a picture of a African-American male saying to the camera, social justice and inclusion for me doesn't mean there isn't social justice for you. And it's okay. Mm -hmm. And, and you, I, it makes you smile, but at the same time, it makes you think at the end of the day, it's about the power. It, it's about that, if you want to use uh, one of the more popular um, images, cast. It's the pyramid. Yeah. As the pyramid starts yes. to break down, yes. if you are in the top echelon of that pyramid, does that suddenly mean that you're at the bottom? Do we still have the stratification or do all those stratifications move away? And if you've been told for years or you've known or it's been intrinsically part of your, your thought process that if we take the stratification away, my identity of who I am and what I am goes with it. And how dare you, person who's not part of the stratification, try to take my seat? And the answer to that is, I'm not trying to take your seat. I just need a seat. Mm -hmm. And there's plenty of seats around here. Um, that's right on. That's a good sorry. point. Yeah, that was right on. And it's an issue that I, you know, was raised in that smart cities think panel yes. that, you know, our, our country is diversifying and those people, the people who have been in power and kind of expected to be in power or have that privilege are, um, you know, they're, they're not liking that because all of a sudden it is under threat um, and they're, uh, they're afraid of the change. And, and so that's, it seems like that's part of the dynamic of what we're seeing 
in this acting out and, and acts of violence. Louise, I think that's interesting because I, I was part of a, dis a discussion group on Monday and I shared this the same sentiment. But here's the thing. The US and the world has known since the late 60s and 70s, sociologists predicted that the US would brown. And I'm talking about in, in color, um, yeah. amount of melanin, that the languages that would be spoken globally would be Spanish and Chinese. That in the US, Spanish would be the second language. And there were those who said, oh, those sociologists, what do they know? That's a silly idea. And here we are. We saw this in the 90s where we were being told by those who were looking at total quality management and how we can be more efficient that, hey, you should learn to speak Spanish or at least learn to read it. Or, you know, there's a growing number of people who speak Chinese. You might want to learn to speak Chinese. Oh, we please forget that. And now we have communities. I'm in one of them where we're using terms like majority minority to which I've asked my team not to use and just say we have a, a, the, 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 instead we have a majority and the majority as people of color. And again, it's back to the, the, the power differential. Wait, you're in the majority. Do I have to give up my seat? Absolutely not. But when you think about who's at the table and you're telling me that your community, your structures of power represent the people that you serve and it doesn't, we need to make some changes. Mm -hmm. And again, this doesn't mean that you have to leave, but it certainly means that that person needs to be able to pull up their, their folding chair or take, take a seat next to you, however yeah. you want to make yeah. that happen. The table is big. There's plenty nice. of room at the table. The table can accommodate everybody. I think that's another big part of it. The big lie is Trump referred mm -hmm. to is this notion that if I'm, you know, if I, if I'm fearing losing something, it's because there's not enough. And there is enough. We, there is enough in this country to get done anything we absolutely want to get done. There is enough, there's enough room, there's enough jobs, there's enough, there's enough food, there's enough means to, a, there's enough means to healthcare, there's enough ways to achieve, to get kids, our kids educated. There is enough. We just not had the means to distribute that power, that information in the past. And we people have just rested on that. Yeah, it's mine. I've got mine, you know, kind of screw you, but it's, there's enough. There's enough for everyone to get, um, to accomplish what we need to, to be a great nation. And we've and seen that community. in some studies on, uh, you know, in diversifying corporate boards where, you know, they, they say that when the more diverse your board becomes, it actually improves your economic performance. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that's a powerful yeah. study and yeah. result. Yeah, absolutely. 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 And I think that's that's a good place for us now that we're out of time to wind up today. We got a wonderful question from a viewer about how do we distinguish between whether a corporate action is principled or whether it's just performance and shibai, as we call it here. And we can get to that next time. And we hope you folks will come back and join us. Yeah, two more question. weeks. There are many, that's many more conversations to be had. The more diverse and plentiful you are, and the more you participate, the better these get. So we welcome you all. Thank you for joining us. Remember to help support Think Tech Hawaii, which makes these difficult conversations possible. They're for all of us, and all of you are welcome in them. Thank you all.